Uh, we are here live from the University at Albany Libraries, uh, here with Trudy E. Jacobson and uh, my colleague uh, Betty Hurley Dasgupta. And we're really excited about this presentation. I just want to take this time to thank you, Carol, for all the great work that you've done in developing this MOOC, and as well as uh, your, your great work with Betty. Uh, this, we're very, very excited about this here at Empire State College and the Center for Distance Learning. And uh, let's go. Let's move forward now with our, with our presentation. Um, I really wanted to start with this image. This is a, uh, an artwork that I saw at Mass MoCA, which is uh, close by here in uh, Mass close, close to us in Massachusetts. And it's a great museum, contemporary art museum. And I turned the corner and I saw this uh, work and it just jumped out at me for so many different reasons. First of all, the absurdity of this image of trying to capture uh, Wikipedia in a traditional book format. Um, obviously, that's, that's not something that we can do. And I think that this is some of the issues that we're dealing with today in terms of how does information, uh, how does our experience with information and technologies translate? So this uh, London-based uh, uh, artist, uh, Rob Matthews, I think really captured this in a fascinating way, where as it says here, he's, he's really interested in the translation of objects, images, and ideas from one medium to another. And I think in many ways that's what we're dealing with. I think that that's what transli transliteracy in particular it, it involves with. What are the skills that are needed for that, that translation? And uh, this, this next slide, I think uh, this quote is interesting too, because this idea of trying to give physical form to Wikipedia. We know that Wikipedia is probably the most successful open wiki project to date, uh, but how do you put that into a traditional book format? Uh, not really, not really possible. Although a lot of comparisons have been made between the traditional encyclopedia and, and Wikipedia, um, so I think these are some of the challenges that, that we're really faced with today: is moving from a, a more traditional print and book culture to one that really is based on open environments, personal learning environments, hypertext, and digital media. Now. I'd like to start, too, with the standard definitions of information literacy, and we'll see later when we, we talk about this, when we talk about our, the meta-literacy framework that Trudy and I developed. What we really, well, we'll talk about that in, in detail, but what we really saw with meta-literacy is that what we we're trying to do is, as the, the title of our article suggests, we're really trying to reframe information literacy for the digital media age, and we're trying to really build on this very strong foundation and and decades of work in the area of information literacy. And if you look at the standard definitions, we think that there's a core principles here that are critical no matter what technology format you're, you're working with. But what we're trying to do and what so many other uh, researchers and authors are trying to do today and teachers, practitioners, is really move beyond this at the same time. So our argument is let's build on this, but when we look at the standard definition, we don't think it goes far enough. But if you look at this, it's really key, this idea of uh, having the ability to determine an, an information need, being able to effectively access information. You can see how that is critically important today when there's so many different information choices and so many different, different format, technology formats. The ability to evaluate information is critically important still today. Uh, and also then, uh, although it doesn't explicitly say produce information, it does say gain the skills so that you can incorporate information into, into one's knowledge base. Also the ability to use information and then understand some of the deeper economic, legal, and social issues surrounding information. So to us, this is an important framework, framework but look at the date, 1989. This was really pre-web and so much has changed since this, these original standards were developed and we're very interested in then building on uh, this foundation and, and pushing it further. And that's what meta-literacy is about. We'll be talking about that as we move forward. Now I'm going to hand this off to uh, Trudy, who will be talking about first the, the, the seven pillars of information literacy and then also visual literacy. So Trudy, uh, back to you. Thank you, Tom.
sorry to break in right now, but I'm not hearing you, Trudy, if you're speaking. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, I can hear you now. All right, I understand that I was not heard before, so I just wanted to mention on this slide here um, that the Association of College and Research Libraries has put together a uh, group that is looking at deciding whether or not the um, standard definition needs to be updated for um, the future, and uh, I think it's going to be really exciting work. Okay, so Tom had mentioned uh, the seven pillars of information literacy, the core model for higher education. This comes out of um, SCONAL, which is um, in the United Kingdom. It's a society for college, national, and university libraries. And this is a brand new version of their pillars model. This was just released earlier this year. Um, and you can see um, that there are seven pillars, and if you look at them, um, you might see, if you're looking at them from left to right, that they don't seem to necessarily uh, fall in a logical order. So manage, evaluate, present, gather, identify, plan, scope. Um, might be hard to actually evaluate your sources before you gather them, if that's the mode in which you're thinking of evaluation. But they are looking at these in a circular manner. Um, so actually, as pillars, um, I guess you could think of them as holding up the information uh, literacy skills. And um, they're not necessarily meant to be seen in a uh, linear or uh, left to right type of manner. And they talk about this as a three-dimensional circular building. And it's based on an individual's own perception of the information landscape. So you might be developing at different paces through different pillars. Uh, often there is a correspondence, and it may also vary between um, fields that you're looking at as well. Okay. So I think that these seven pillars do reflect the multifaceted um, or multifaced information environment. Um, and I think that it provides a more expansive uh, definition of information literacy. Uh, in thinking about that, uh, one of their pillars is to present information. And they have sets of abilities that go with the various pillars. And one of these abilities in the present information is to develop a personal profile using personal networks, digital technologies. And I think that that's something that we're all involved in doing. And from what I'm seeing people involved in this MOOC doing, um, being able to do that even more. All right. So when I think back to the teaching that I do, the students that I work with, um, I've been teaching an information literacy course now for a bit over a decade. And students did written documents, which they turned in. They had presentations based upon their research. Um, and this is not something that just students were doing, um, that I, as a professional, usually wrote documents made presentations. I really didn't have a lot of options. Um, but now, things are very different. Um, there's all sorts of possibilities. And these are probably, um, you're involved in a number of these online communities. The information may also be more transient than it has been in the past. Um, although information can still be accessed, um, for example, say on a blog, things happen so quickly, it may be that you're not as likely to go back and to access that information. So uh, let me turn this over to Tom for the next couple of slides. Thanks, Trudy. And we've actually already received a question uh, from Chrissy, uh, what about networking? And I do think that that's a critically important part of this as well. This is, this is why the information environment has changed so much that it's not just the individual
individual creating a, a print document and su submitting it to the professor, for example, or you know, sending a letter to someone, that we are in a highly uh, networked environment that also impacts what we need certainly to teach students and how we understand information today. So some of the examples here, uh, you know, PB Works, these are really focused on uh, open participatory environments. And I think that that's really what we need to maximize. And that's why the standard definitions of information literacy, while it's certainly a, a, an important framework, uh, is not uh, necessarily uh, uh, complete and doesn't necessarily account for these kinds of um, issues. Plus one pillar, networking pillar. Oh, so is that the question too? The, uh, so the question too is from Chrissy, should we have a pillar that's focused specifically on networking? Is that the, is that the question? I think that's a really good, good idea. What do you think of that, Trudy? This idea of actually adding a pillar that is networking itself. Uh, that's an interesting point, Tom. And I think that um, I need to look back through some of the different aspects of the seven pillars because they go into more depth and there are more um, sort of pieces to each of them. Uh, but if the networked information is not a part of it, then I think it certainly is um, ripe for consideration. Thanks. And we'll talk about, we're going to get to a more specific definition of what we mean by meta literacy. So this is just providing background information trying to lead up to that. That's an excellent question. Um, for all the par current participants, if you could submit your questions via Twitter, that would be really helpful because yeah. apparently are we having a problem with yeah. the we're having a problem with the, the the room right now in Illuminate the chat room. So if you could submit your questions via Twitter, that would be great. So the hash mark hash mark CMC eleven. So it's hash mark CMC eleven. Hash mark CMC eleven in Twitter and we'll respond to your questions. We have a few moments in the presentation where we're going to just take questions, but I'm also fine with just the free flow of this and taking questions as we go along. I think that question of networking is really critically important. And network literacy is actually one of the, the literacies, too, that as you, as you review the literature that's certainly out there. So uh, this idea, too, of what happened. Um, Certainly a big part of this is the social media context, which is, and this is what we, we wrote about in our, our essay on this, is that the, our understanding of information itself is transformed considerably. That information is not just this static document that, that people access. And even thinking about Google, I mean, if you think about how people search information and they retrieve information, that to me is a big part of it, and that's a part of the web. But for me, it's always been about the dynamic nature of information and the, the fact that the web itself is a participatory medium, and it was always intended to be that way. So in today's information environment and social media, information itself is a dynamic entity. It's something that's produced. It's shared collaboratively. And uh, the, the term Web 2.0, which was, has been around now for several, several years, it still it works well in terms of explaining Facebook, Twitter, Delicious Second Life. Uh, and this is certainly what our students are immersed in. And this is an environment that I think that we need to account for in, in our understanding of, of literacies. And Trudy, did you want to add to that? Um, just let me mention, um, I did go back and start to look through some of the additional information available with the seven pillars and the network uh, information. Uh, I noticed that, say, in the section on gathering, both understanding that you need to gather information and the abilities, there are a number of items there that we are looking to network information. So I think although the very short labels of the pillars do not necessarily fully uh, explain the content, I think that they were, they were along the same line. All right. So, uh, so uh, the seven pillars come from the United Kingdom. United Kingdom. Uh, UNESCO is another um, organization that uh, is taking a look at what they call information and media literacy. Uh, this is something that's really on the um, horizon with a number of different uh, 
uh, organizations, IFLA, the uh, International Federation of Library Associations, um, is also taking a look at this. Uh, UNESCO has been particularly active, and they do have a, a sector called um, communication and information sector. And they say that empowerment of people through information and media literacy is an important prerequisite for fostering equitable access to information and knowledge and building inclusive knowledge societies. Um, so, and they are looking at it in a variety of different contexts. Um, some of the countries in which um, they are doing work may not have some of the same technologies that we have, but they think face the same um, challenges of, of information gathering and evaluation that we do. Um, UNESCO's definition acknowledges the importance of multiple literacy types, the need for the critical evaluation of sources, and inclination and the skill that provides the cohesiveness needed to attend to the increasingly broad scope of information formats and the ability to use what tools are available to be able to create and produce information and to share that information with others. So it really, I think, is extremely exciting how um, lots and lots of different organizations, different countries are taking a look right now at the critical importance and the changing nature of information literacy. Okay, thanks, Trudy. And uh, I think one of the key reports uh, that we all look at in terms of looking at trends, and I think that this further emphasizes this point of how much the, the information and technology environment has changed and what, you know, what are the current and emerging trends. So the Horizon Report identified these top six. So ebooks, mobile devices, augmented reality, game based learning gesture-based computing and learning analytics. And there's an image here of uh, a researcher at MIT lab of working with this uh, augmented reality device, which is just fascinating. So what I think is interesting here is not, not only that it's a, this top six list, but that it's a, the way that some of these technologies are converging. And we've been talking about converging now for, for many years in our understanding of technologies. But think about the potential for combining, for example, augmented virtual reality, mobile devices, and game-based learning. Also think about the impact of e-books. We've been talking about the, the possible you know, end of books for, you know, you know, since the 90s, perhaps be, before that. Uh, and we're now at a, a place where, it, I don't see it as the end of books, but it is certainly a change where more and more people are using the electronic book readers. Um, to access this information, making it more portable. Their experience with the book is, is very different, but people are, are still reading and, and gaining information and knowledge that way. Uh, but think about this, how transformative that is, certainly within an you know, educational environment, how we can maximize the use of that book, those electronic resources. And it's, I also find it interesting, too, that the, the success of the, the Kindle and the Nook and the other book readers and the use of the iPad is the fact that how similar they are in the design and the fact that the experience in some ways tries to replicate the turning of the page, um, the, the, the actual look of a, a printed book, but there's much more that you can do with it. You can search it, you can share it, you can download it from any location. So there's this portability aspect that is critically in, important. And I just want to show this, uh, this, is, uh, this slide as well. Uh, which is uh, an augmented virtual reality app that you could just download now called Layer. And uh, this is just, the, to me, a fascinating example of this really uh, pop culture fun use of this, of imagine being able to go to Abbey Road and not only go there and walk across, which we all do if, we, if we're in that area. And, and when you go there, it's just fascinating to see uh, people doing this, and I did it. You get your picture taken, you know, rep, you know, replicating that experience of the Beatles walking across. But imagine now being, a, being at that site with a mobile device, being able to map data over that, so you're taking a virtual tour. And this is, a, this is really a screenshot of what is an actual the Beatles discovery tour, so that if you're at that location using Layer, 
you can really take a virtual tour in the same way that you would take a virtual tour of a museum. So what are the literacy implications then of mobility? And there's an excellent article by by David Perry called Mobile Perspectives on Teaching Mobile Literacy, where he really defines these three key points to mobile literacy, sort of understanding information access, and think about how that changes within a, a mobile, portable world, where you're accessing information, not, not sitting down on a computer, um, not using a, a browser, certainly not going back to the days of using a card catalog, but you are uh, accessing information on the spot, sharing that information, and really combining multiple sets of, of data and information using, a, using the mobile and the augmented reality. Also thinking in terms of hyper-connectivity. So this idea of hypertext and trying to understand how that changes our, our understanding of text because you can link and make associative links. Uh, so think about that as well in the context of a, a mobile device where you're accessing information, networking. Chris had made this point about how, how critically important networking is. Well, you are on the spot in a, an augmented virtual reality experience, sharing information, and in some ways, creating your own sense of reality on the spot, on the fly. And then also, as part of that, um, Perry describes this idea of understanding a new sense of space. So think about how that mobile device places you at any location, not only, be able to, not only being able to connect to other, other people through, a, through, it, through the device as a phone, but this transformative experience of being able to uh, uh, access, uh, create, produce, and share information on the spot. So a lot of potential with this, and again, people are already talking about this and the literacy implications and how information has changed when the information environment itself is a portable one. Also, it's also important to note here that the Horizon Report addresses what they call digital media literacy. So there's so many different literacy types today, and many people are trying to address it. Digital literacy is, is a term that's used. Media literacy is a term that's used. And now Horizon Report is actually calling it digital media literacy. And also in this, this quote, emphasizing the, the importance of it, how important this is, um, although they critique the fact that it may not be well-defined or universally taught. I think that one of the reasons that it may not be well-defined is that it's changing so much and because there's so many different literacy types. And what we're leading up to here is an argument that what we see is important is looking at information literacy as a, itself as a meta-literacy that has the opportunity really to connect these multiple literacy types. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. And one last slide about the Horizon Report is that even in terms of uh, teacher preparation programs are saying um, they're beginning to address digital media literacy, um, but that more work needs to be done in this area, that it's happening uh, slowly. Although this, certainly I think this is an exciting time to be involved in any kind of literacy studies because of the, the changes in emerging technologies and people are really paying attention and really trying to incorporate these changes in uh, literacy frameworks. Now I'll give it back to uh, Trudy. Thank you, Tom. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about visual literacy. And after we've done this, we will take a break and there will be time for questions. Um, there are, as Tom has been saying, there are a number of different literacies that are being talked about. And we'll be coming back to that later in this presentation. Um, the emphasis on visual literacy is that it permeates so much of all of the other literacies. And the Association of College and Research Libraries um, is actually taking a look at a set of visual literacy standards. And they have begun work on that and actually have a draft of it. And this is a quote from that draft that came out just uh, last month. So the importance of images and visual media in contemporary culture is changing what it means to be literate in the 21st century. Okay. So they are finding that there are some unique issues connected to visual literacy and the way that people should be critically interacting with the visual content. Um, and these surround viewing it, using it, and also producing information in a visual format. So um, rather than to just, just do that as text, here is a visual uh, that shows 
the different aspects of visual literacy from defining the need, finding it, interpreting it, evaluating it, using it, and then creating it. And as a person who's sort of struggling in uh, today's world and for visual literacy, I probably can get there with uh, some of these earlier ones, but that idea of creating it to me seems a little bit challenging because I don't think of myself really as a visual person. So a little bit more about these standards that are coming out of the Association of College and Research uh, Libraries. Um, they see them as a tool for educator. they're tr educators trying to establish a framework. Um, how should people go about developing their skills? And how also can they assess um, learning outcomes um, that they may be teaching? Now, data visualization is uh, an aspect of visual literacy and one that I'm particularly involved with because of the teaching of information literacy that I do. Some of you may be familiar with the blog, Information is Beautiful. Uh, by David McCandless. He's also done a wonderful TED talk uh, about data visualization. And here is just a screenshot from a selection of visualizations that is on the blog. Uh, there are a couple of other blogs that you might be interested in if you would like to explore this further. One is coolinfographics.com and another is chatporn.org. So take a look at this. I know it's really hard to see, but I think you get the idea here. On the left, you can see some data. Uh, and if you were able to actually read it, what you could see was it is assessing different sort of social media tools and um, what percentage of the users are male versus female. On the right, you can see that information presented much more graphically um, with the actual logos of the various uh, tools and then the figures as to sort of male and female. And um, what you can see is that there's some equality on a few, and then the screen starts, sh starts showing you where um, the women lead. And down at the bottom, if you were to see the whole thing, and this comes from the Information is Beautiful blog, uh, there is, I believe, just one where uh, males do um, exceed sort of the usage of females. Uh, so because a lot of people get their information much better from these visualizations and thinking about the theme of this course uh, in the MOOC, uh, there's a lot of room here for effective creativity in creating these visualizations. But I think it's a new way of thinking. So at this point, we do have the opportunity for, to take uh, your questions. And I'll turn this over to Tom to do that. <laughs> Thanks, Trudy. And we actually have a question here from Chrissy. What about multi-literacy, which would include all the different facets of digital literacies? Yes, um, I think that this is certainly uh, along the lines of, of what we're thinking, but we we really see our, our and we're going to get to this in, in a second. But my take on this is that looking at we're calling it meta literacy because we see a role for information literacy. And what we're trying to do is really think about what does information literacy look like in the 21st century? What does it look like if it considers um, digital literacy, social media? open educational resources. We think we need an overarching framework that connects all of these, especially considering the fact that there are so many different types. So while multi-literacy is, is also focused on combining, we're, in our argument, we're actually saying that we, we want to make connections to other literacy types through information literacy. And we're going to show a, a chart momentarily, a table that really represents what we see as some of the, the connections. So it's a really good question. I do think that there are a lot of other literacies out there, and there's definitely an effort to unite. Multiliteracy is one of them. And we'll talk momentarily about our framework and how, how we see that contributing. Any other questions? Um, this is just a comment. Visual literacies, I'm trying to use photo voices to reflect and encourage others, too. Yeah. Excellent. The, the excellent example. And then another question. 
And is visual literacy a new way of thinking, or do we just have more accessible tools now and can share easily? That's a good, what do you think about that, Trudy? Is, is the way that visual literacy is currently being looked at, is, is that something that's truly different, or is it because we have access to so many different I think it's a combination of both. Um, I think that um, they play into one another. So because we have the tools available to us, I think more people are thinking about actually doing it. But because so much of what we're seeing and the way people find that they communicate better is through visualizations that um, some of us, I think, do need to change the way we think about it. I'm really used to reading charts and tables, but if I take a look at some of these well-done visualizations, I find that I grasp the information much more quickly. And I'll turn this back to Tom. We can actually uh, see what questions are coming up. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, just a reminder, too, that if, you, if you've joined us since I made this announcement previously, uh, we're, we're now taking questions through the, the Twitter for CNC 11, so it's hashtag CNC 11. For some reason, we're having a problem with our chat function in Illuminate right now. So if you could uh, answer, ask your questions through hashtag CNC 11. And now we're going to really get into, that was all intended to be a, a background leading up to this. And I'm looking at the clock too, and I see that we have to really pick up our pace a little bit. So let's really get into what the, these two emerging frameworks Transliteracy and, and meta literacy. I'd like to start it with uh, this is something that's about to come out. This, this essay, and we're we're really thrilled about this. It's uh, it will be a, a appearing in an upcoming reference services review, and it's by uh, Michelle Kathleen Dunaway. And she, it's really interesting. She uses connectivism to connect uh, the, these two emerging trends we're talking about today, which is meta literacy and transliteracy. And I think that her definition of the two here is really fairly accurate. This is how we see it, that both meta-literacy and trans-literacy challenge traditional skills-based concepts of information literacy by recognizing the role of emerging technologies, suggesting that information technology is a central component of students' learning. That is, I, I really agree with that. I think that this, too, is how the, the meta-literacy framework is different from the previous information literacy. Uh, I think that information literacy was well-intended when it first came out because it was really trying to differentiate itself but it was trying to talk about the deeper information skills, the critical thinking skills, and it was trying to differentiate itself from just computer skills. But in some ways, I think that that created maybe an initial divide uh, where the, the emerging technologies that evolved after 1989 were maybe not as well addressed as, as they could have been. So I think that a lot of the discussion of information literacy today, and what we're trying to talk about is, is to bring in those emerging literacies as a central part of the framework. So we're really thrilled with this, this article that will be coming out by Matt, uh, Michelle Dunaway. She also goes on to say that meta-literacy and trans-literacy are frameworks for understanding information literacy that emphasize the importance of communities, connections, information networks. Chrissy, you had asked about networks, the importance of networks previously, and information technologies. I also agree with the statement that this is for the meta-literacy framework, this is critically important. It really is talking about information in the information environment in a networked world of communities, online communities. That's what we talk about in our paper. Uh, the connections that you can make through a participatory online and, and mobile communities, uh, critically uh, important. And then the article goes on to really also talk about connectivism and making this connection between the connectivism as a learning theory and how it can actually be applied in information literacy. So now we have these three layers, which I think are really fascinating, the, the discussion of uh, transliteracy, the discussion of meta-literacy, and now Dunaway is adding to the mix this idea of connectivism. Because what she's saying here in this quote, these concepts are central to the principles of the theory of connectivism, which postulates that communities, connections, information networks, and information technologies are central to the learning of process. And I also uh, agree with, with, with that part of this. So this is based on a preprint that is coming out. Uh, I would encourage you to check it out. It's, we're really excited that our meta literacy framework is, is really even being discussed within, within, these, within these context. And I do think that uh, she's really onto something by making those connections. Now let's talk about transliteracy. And uh, I'm going to try and move quicker here. Uh, this really emerged from the Transliteracy Research Group. 
And uh, look, look at this definition, which is fairly broadly defined. It's really talking about the abilities going from reading, writing across a range of platforms. Across a, and this is really the, the field, of the, the, the information environment that we have today. It's really not just talking about one single delivery mode or one single technology. It's really a range of modes. And this is why I think transliteracy has uh, been embraced so much by the library community in particular. But it is interesting that this emerged outside of the, the, really the field of information science and information studies and library and information science, but it's been embraced by those communities, I think because it directly addresses these issues of emerging technologies and the skills and the, the knowledge that is required. A little bit more about this. Also, the Transliteracies uh, project is a big part of this. It was established in the year 2005. Also key that this was an interdisciplinary group in humanities, social science, and sciences, and engineering. Uh, we're from an interdisciplinary institution at Empire State College, so this is critically important. And I can see how uh, transliteracy as an idea would emerge from this particular group. So it's a critically important part of understanding that. And the idea too that a, someone who's transliterate has the ability to write or print a letter or word using the closest corresponding letters of a different alphabet or language. This idea, idea of having the abilities, again, across multiple modes, across multiple platforms. Uh, and you can see how this idea would be embraced by library and information science when the, the field of information science and library and information science is focused so much on the, the, the ability of individuals to work with information in so many different ways. Also, this, another part of this definition I like is the idea of mapping meaning across different uh, media. So this idea, too, that the individual is gaining knowledge, is very much uh, making those connections among multiple diff, uh, information uh, types within, a, within an information environment, critically important. So that's transliteracy. Um, and it's also another key point here, too, that it's not just learning one of these technologies. And this is where I think that um, it's, there's a connection to meta-literacy, and not just the technology, but the literacy, literacy itself. When you have so many literacies out there, it's not about learning just one, and that they're not in isolation, but this recognition that it's, it's really integrated. I think incredibly important uh, for today's information environment. So let's talk now about meta literacy. We're almost, we're almost near, you know, we only have like 15 minutes left here, and we're already just starting to talk about meta literacy. So let me go through this. What Tom, we focus on is the idea Tom, that this really let promotes. Let me interrupt here for a second. Yes. You can take additional time if you wish. No, no, no. So we, we can go over. Carol just gave us permission to go over. Oh, oh. <laughs> You can. All right, you may want to not want to do that. We'll be here all day. <laughs> but okay, then I'll be a little less worried about the time. So we, we could go over a little bit. So we appreciate that, Carol. So our focus, and I think that this, and this is central to information literacy, that it really is about critical thinking. But we try to expand that, and we're trying to be more explicit about the fact that it's critical thinking and collaboration in a digital age. And that the meta literacy framework we see, again, as looking at information literacy itself as an overarching framework, one that addresses uh, participatory, uh, active, open social media and online communities. Um, so I think there are some parallels there to transliteracy, but we're really doing this within uh, the, the world of information literacy and really trying to look at that in a different way. So that to us, it's central. We're, we're not saying uh, that we just want to do away with everything that's been done, all this work that's been done in information literacy, but really redefine it, uh, remap it, uh, re reformat it, and think of it in new ways, and be more explicit about the emerging technologies that we think are, are critically important to uh, um, building communities, communicating, and, and working with multiple modalities in today's uh, dynamic information environment. Now, this is a, a visual that we're working on because we are, we did the article, we're currently working on a book on meta literacy, and we're uh, very happy that Roger LaPera here from the University of Albany Libraries, he helped, he's, he's developed this uh, based on our original concept and doing this in Adobe Illustrator, and we're, we're really happy about this. Um, but this, let me talk through this a little bit and, and see see how this looks. And we've actually expanded this. We didn't use a figure in the, uh, the College and Research Libraries article, but we have used something similar to put presentations on this. And we've actually expanded it since that 
discussion, and I'll explain that in a second. If you look at this, and again, it looks like this big target, but uh, and it is, but what we're, we're trying to show is an integrated, comprehensive model that unites sort of the key foundation elements of information literacy within a collaborative framework. So if you look at this, you can see some of the key uh, parts of information literacy, the ability to determine, evaluate, access and understand information in that, that first sort of uh, wheel of, uh, that, that's, that's happening there. Um, and then because those, uh, those skills now are mediated by social media and online communities and also mobile devices and open educational resources, especially now as open educational resources emerge as, a, as this global uh, approach to producing, sharing, and reusing information for education in both formal and informal settings, that we're now actually adding OERs to our, to our framework. So that because this mediation is happening between those basic core skills, that what we see is, a, is, is an emergence in, of uh, the ability to share information, information and produce information, which is building on uh, what is already in the, the foundation information literacy, which is also to use and incorporate, but we're being much more explicit that use means that the user is producing information, sharing it in a participatory, collaborative, online environment. And we're also making, you know, collaborate, this idea of collaboration key to, to, this, to this framework. So it looks like a target, but it is meant to be this meta-literacy, this, this overarching framework that builds on the core elements of information uh, literacy. So that's what is happening with that visual, and that may, uh, by the time that we're done with the book, this may evolve even further, but that's, that's where we are in our thinking. Uh, it's critically important as well to think about the, the impact of mobile devices, as I mentioned previously, the fact that there's access to information and the sharing is happening not just at the computer anymore, at the web browser, but it's also happening uh, on, on the fly and, and uh, uh, on the move. And also with open educational resources, I think is critically important. Uh, we're you know, doing more with open learning. We see ourselves actually as an open learning institution, and we're exploring the, the potential for not only um, referring to, to and using open educational resources in our, in our online and mobile studies, but also to be producers of open educational resources so that we're thinking about um, how we can actually create OERs that can then be shared so that someone else can reuse those materials in, in, this, in this open environment. So if you're thinking about an, not only an online environment and a dynamic digital environment, but one that is also open and, and is sharing, what impact that then does that have on the, the core literacy skills that, that someone needs to be thinking about? Uh, I don't think that collaboration, for example, is necessarily a given in any context, and I think that uh, that requires some you know, hard work and some study and some uh, experience in, in doing so. That's, so that's why I think collaboration as a, a foundation element is critically important to this framework. Now, this is the, the chart I referred to. And again, this is not something that we used in the original article. We will probably use it in the, uh, in the, in the book. We're, we're trying to, to, to this, is, this in some ways was created for our own, our own thinking about this. And if you look at this chart, what's, what's interesting, I think, is that at the very top, if we look at this expanded definition of information literacy, determine, access, evaluate, understand, incorporate, organize, use, then add to that, produce, share, collaborate. And then you can find connections to these other literacy types. So the explicit connections where the exact word is used or the same concept is also in, in gray. So for example, media literacy explicitly talks about the ability to access information, uh, to analyze, which is very close to evaluate, to understand, to create, again, that focus on the user, uh, not, you know, the, the user as producer and not just consumer, uh, and then being able to participate. And again, with a particular focus on media. The, the digital, the, the standard digital literacy definition is also focused on the ability to access, uh, to be able to read text, sound, image, uh, the ability to make informed judgment, which I see as uh, being able to understand and to critically evaluate. Uh, the idea also of being able to rep reproduce data and images, so there's that built-in creation, production, incorporation, organi organization, and use. Um, 
And then also then if you continue to follow this down, information communication and technology literacy is focused on the ability to access, evaluate. Critical thinking is, is a part of, of that framework. Being able to integrate, create, manage information, which is, uh, I see a parallel there to incorporate and an explicit mention of organize and use. We've already talked about visual literacy. Cyber literacy is really focused particularly on internet content, being able to critically consume and understand information. Again, in the second half of this, being an active participant, being someone who's more than a user. And in cyber literacy, this, this really interesting focus on being able to voice an opinion. And think about that as a, as a key literacy as well, um, and, and how we may want to prepare our students and ourselves for being effective at voicing an opinion in these, these multiple modalities. So this, as you can see, I mean, we, when we look at this, uh, we're not looking at information literacy or, or meta literacy, even though it's at the top here as, uh, in, in a hierarchical sense, but we are looking at these relationships among the different literacy types. And I think that with so many emerging literacy types, now is a critically important time to be thinking not only how they interact, but what is, you know, the relationship within these core uh, literacy types. So that's what we're trying to accomplish by looking at a, a meta-literacy meta -literacy format. And, and then uh, for us, we see uh, trans-literacy also as part of this framework, because trans-literacy is really talking about the ability to read, which to us is about the ability to access and evaluate, uh, the ability to write, which includes the, the uh, literacies for understanding and incorporating, and again, that essential part, which is central to today's dynamic mobile interactive environments is the ability to interact. Uh, so it's for us, again, this was a planning document that helped us think through the ideas for the, the article. We see these connections among these types of literacies. And these are the core ones that we developed, but there, there are many more. And I think that this could be mapped, this idea of a meta-literacy can be mapped over others that, that emerge. So uh, the, the last part of the presentation is really focused on how this works in the real world, how this, uh, how this meta literacy is accomplished in practice. But before we do that, um, are there questions that, um, I can, that we can address? Well, this is back under the, the skills, or we, we just talked about skills or about behaviors. You'll have to say the question again. So do we just talk about skills or also about behaviors? I think that um, it is, I think that moving beyond skills, and I know I'm, it's, it's hard not to use that, that term, because I do think there's a connection to all this, especially when you're talking about literacy, but I think one of the goals that we have tried to accomplish in our research on, on this, in our own writing, is to actually get beyond skills. Because often in the article, we're, we really intensely try to reframe it as thinking not only about that, those discrete skills, but what is the knowledge that emerges. So thinking of it as almost a, maybe a skill set that creates knowledge or a knowledge set and maybe eliminating the word skills itself because I think that's another problem in the, the world of information literacy is that it's often seen as just skills production that we're somehow preparing students for skills when it's so much broader than that. I think that it has an uh, impact on knowledge. Now, in terms of behaviors, um, I'm not sure. Maybe, Trudy, you're nodding your head, so I think that you, you can address that one. Yes, thanks, Tom. Uh, one of the things I'm thinking about here is an analogy with critical thinking. And in critical thinking, there is um, both the um, sort of willingness to do it as well as the ability to do it. And I think that that transfers over to this, that um, one has to be inclined, one also has to be able to conceive of the possibilities um, as well as to be able to do them. So I do think that the, the behaviors are involved here and um, just sort of the willingness and um, being able to get over perhaps if there are barriers or fears. Tom? Thanks, Trudy. Excellent. Uh, Chrissy has a note. A number of other really interesting questions here, I think, that address what we're trying to get at, too. Uh, first, you ask, are there possibilities to group other literacies? I absolutely think so. Um, I think that as, as we work in the 
book, we, we looked at some others as well, and we'll be discussing others. What we're hoping is that, uh, and we're actually excited this is to some extent happening, that people are talking about meta-literacy and comparing it to, to trans-literacy, and they're now talking about constructivism, uh, that the idea is out there, and it, we hope that it makes a contribution. So can others be grouped in this? I think so, and I think that that's a big part of looking at this idea of a meta literacy as this, as this kind of overarching framework where information is central to, to this uh, exploration. So absolutely. Um, and then there are loads of literacies needed to function in the digital age. How can we support individuals to develop this? I think we're going to discuss that in the next section of meta literacy in practice and then, um, and then creative thinking and creative thinking. And there's a question to choose. Uh, now, just and when you were talking about behaviors, and what about creative thinking with behaviors rather than skills? Okay. So the question here is um, whether there is um, behaviors involved with creative thinking as well as skills. Um, creative thinking isn't something that I've spent as much time thinking about, but it does seem to me that. Um, that one would have to be inclined to do that. Um, I hope that I'm answering the question correctly, uh, you know, answering the correct question. Um, but I think that um, unless one is born a creative thinker, one really needs to start schooling oneself to, to, to do that. Tom? Thanks, Trudy. And now let's talk about, I think that this question about, you know, can you teach creativity. I mean, I think in, in some ways that you can, and some of the examples we're going to talk about get at that. And I see that we're, we're approaching the, the one hour. I think we could probably go over five or ten minutes. So uh, this, this last section is really about meta-literacy and practice. And this is based on the, the second part of the, the essay that we developed. So just, if we could just, uh, we really want to just kind of frame this a little bit. So if you think about what we've discussed so far, the, the changes in emerging technologies, the interconnectedness that we all experience now, that the importance of, of network and dynamic environments and mobile, think about then how critically important it is, if we're thinking about a meta-literacy, uh, to understand format type and delivery mode. So this to me is why it's critically important to put emerging technologies themselves back into the mix. So we can't just look at information. Uh, we have to look about the changes in technologies, the changes in format. If you think about that original image that I showed that I started with, of uh, mm -hmm. yeah, this absurd image of uh, <laughs> Wikipedia as an actual physical encyclopedia. Um, think about how different Wikipedia is and, and some of the understanding that needs to take place and the fact that it is a collaboratively produced document, uh, the ultimate hypertext in many ways, a document that is not just for uh, uh, searching but also for producing. But I'm not sure if, in fact, I, I recently wrote about this in an essay that just came out in First Monday on uh, uh, transparent design. I, I critique Wikipedia a little bit at the beginning um, because I think that we're so focused sometimes on Wikipedia and the issues of credibility and reliability, and so much of this is in the literature, and I do think it's a, it's a valid argument that we somehow miss the point of the fact that this is collaboratively uh, produced, that there's a peer review process, and that perhaps we're not um, making this as that aspect of it as visible to students as we could. Uh, so it's not just a matter of, you know, is Wikipedia reliable and people say, no, it's not, don't use it. It goes much deeper than that because it raises questions about copyright, uh, peer review, uh, uh, you know, maybe in some ways a radical view of peer review where it's not uh, just a board of experts, uh, but it, you know, it is a, a group of participants out there uh, in, um, in, in, in the world interested in producing this document. So understanding the format ty type and the delivery mode to me is critically important. And Trudy, Trudy I see, has uh, something to add. I just wanted to mention briefly, this is something that came up in my class uh, yesterday, actually, um, 
when Tom was talking about Wikipedia and the focus on um, just sort of evaluation of it. And I think sometimes that um, things are being sort of labeled um, possibly by professors, or the media, I'm not sure exactly whom, but um, I'm seeing with my students, for example, that they needed to find a website that um, provided misinformation and there seemed to be a rush to finding blogs. And um, just the fact that it was a blog seemed to be an indicator that this was not a reputable source of information. Um, and I thought that this was highly interesting because my students were looking at this in one case in connection with information literacy and uh, one student had come across uh, Sheila Weber's blog. Um, so here is a person who is one of the experts in the field, but because it was a blog, it was sort of tarred with that label. So I think that, um, that there's something going on where um, students don't feel that they can be fully open to exploring some of these formats um, because of other things that they're hearing. Trudy, that's a really excellent point. And isn't it interesting then that, I mean, here it is, blogs, wikis, mobile, these are all parts of, I mean, students say this is a part of the world, and yet they would enter a class or they would, they would get this perception that it's somehow discredited. So I think there's a, there's a real uh, problem uh, with looking at it that way. Now, another part of this idea of meta literacy in practice is that you know, evaluating user feedback as active researchers. Again, this is critical thinking. This is this is allowing the student, the individual, to be an active researcher. The fact that someone can follow experts uh, via Twitter, uh, the fact that uh, students can follow uh, someone uh, uh, via a blog who's in expert on a particular topic. So how do we evaluate that information? And then how do we also even evaluate user feedback? Uh, I think the, the easiest thing to do is just dismiss it completely, but I don't think that's the way we should be going about it. Uh, I think that we have to prepare students to really be thinking about how user feedback can be used in a useful way. I mean, you, if you even think about sort of the iTunes and, and how um, sort of the top ten list is based on uh, sort of uh, what people are downloading. Or if you think about even going into Amazon.com um, and the fact that users can actually rate books or something like a TripAdvisor, users can, um, you know, rate uh, uh, hotels or bread and, bre bre bread and bre breakfast, as I totally mumbled my words there, uh, do we just discount count that information because it's freely available on the web, that it could even be anonymous, or do we help to prepare students to be uh, active, critical thinkers of that information, and how do you incorporate that evaluation into your own uh, knowledge base? I think, too, in a, within a meta-literacy framework, uh, how do you create a context for user-generated information? So, um, Again, this, this perhaps is a, although we did not mention explicitly personal learning environments, in some ways I think that this is what that is about, that users are creating their own uh, information environment, uh, their own learning environment where they have all these different choices and many of these information choices as well. So I think that we have to prepare learners to uh, create this context and again, to be critical thinkers and evaluators of user-generated content, uh, and then also to be active producers of their own user-generated content. I'm not just automatically dismissing this because it's not in a traditional format, but finding, um, preparing one uh, to be active and to be critical of, of that information. Also, um, this also leads to this idea of evaluating dynamic uh, content critically. Uh, all part of the, the critical thinking, uh, meta-literacy framework, um, and think about all of the different modes that we have access to, uh, tweets, Facebook postings, LinkedIn, uh, delicious uh, bookmarks. Uh, all of this information, it's transient, it's ongoing, um, it's part of this information environment that we're creating. In many ways, I think that we, uh, if there's not a coherence there in that vast network, I think that we have to help prepare our students to create that coherence. And that, to me, is a, a big part of the, the meta-literacy part and the focus on information itself. Did you want to add to any of that before I move to the next slide, Trudy? Okay, okay. So I'll move on to the next. Um, and then we're, we're leading up to, as well, some examples in our own teaching uh, to, to close this out, but let me talk too about a, a 
a few of these other key principles of, of actually applying this, this theory or this idea of meta-literacy. Um, and we've discussed this so many times already, but this is critically important, uh, the idea of being able to produce original content in multiple media formats. Uh, and that, again, is another reason to bring in uh, an understanding of the technology. Now, the technology itself is always going to change. So in some ways, it's not about computer literacy. It's not about learning a particular computer or computer skill. In many ways, it's about being able to adapt to the, these different kinds of technology. Is the ability to learn how to learn and to be comfortable using these these tools. Um, so that to me is, is, is critically important and, and also being able to, uh, I think that the production part of it leads to the next one which is understanding the personal privacy issues, information ethics, intellectual property issues. Um, think about the importance of uh, Creative Commons because what Creative Commons does, it allows someone really to, you know, not only to search information that's, that's openly available and to upload information that could then be shared, but that the, the licensing part of it, it allows an individual to determine uh, what their own licensing is going to be so that others can perhaps reuse that. To me, that is a critically impor important part of the, the intellectual property. Uh, and not looking at copyright in such a restrictive manner, but really thinking of uh, copyright itself as a is an open opportunity for sharing and for reusing. Um, I think that in all of these environments, um, there have been some high profile um, cases even with the use of Twitter and people sharing, you know, public figures sharing personal information. You would think that people would automatically have a good understanding of, of what that means in these environments where information can be so easily shared. But in, in some of these cases we've seen just this past year, it's, it's not a given. So again, to me, that is a part of the, the knowledge that is, that is key of, of understanding the personal privacy, the information ethics. If you're in a position where you can produce information, uh, I think there's, a, there's an ethical uh, dimension to that in, in terms of what you produce and how you share it. Um, so that, to me, that, that's critically important. And then uh, uh, this, the last part of this is, uh, again, looking at this, itself as a, as a course, a skill or knowledge of, of being able to share information in participatory digital environments, mobile environments, open educational resources. Uh, the, the field is wide open at this point. It continues to change. And I think that this, this part of it is going to be central as, as it emerges. Now, um, I just want to show this quickly too. And this is one of those planning documents in our own thinking, I, I think that this is something that, you know, I think could be useful and, and for the book we may even develop it as, as perhaps something that, that could be shared. But if you, were, if, if you were to look at, this looks similar to the other document, but we, if you notice we've, we've left this wide open because if we were looking at meta-literacy in, in this way and we're looking at information literacy as this overarching framework, how then would these characteristics be applied in all of these different technologies? So we've, we've gone intentionally from the more traditional card catalog, um, which may, if you look at this, may include being able to determine information need, access, information. it's all about access, evaluate, understand, incorporate. It may not, I mean, a card catalog by itself may not necessarily be the, the second half of this is really organize, use, produce, share, although it certainly can lead up to that. Uh, same thing with the library website, which, is, which uh, in many ways takes a card catalog and, and transforms it into a, a hypertext environment. And then a particular database, it could just be, you know, electronic databases. Uh, and it's interesting too, with a lot of the library databases now, they do have that sharing component so that you could just share uh, a full text article and abstract with yourself or uh, through Twitter. Uh, to, so there's, that's already being built into it. But then some of these other technologies, and these are some of the tools I'm using in a course I teach at Empire State College, called digital storytelling, I think that uh, some of these other technologies really have the capability for all of these literacies. So uh, a Wordle, which allows you to create a word cloud based on text, so it's a transformation of text to image, and a Moto, which allows you to create, e easily create a, a video based on images that you upload and combining that with, with music. A blog, of course, uh, which allows you to be the producer of, of information and be able to share that. A micro blogging environments such as Twitter uh, and VoiceThread. 
in my view, I think it, these are all uh, um, you know dynamic uh, resources that allow you allows one to determine information need, think about access in new ways, evaluate uh, you know what it is you're, you're producing and sharing, having a deeper understanding understanding of that information and then of course incorporating it, organizing that information. Think about the, the importance of visual literacy in, in these contexts where you're organizing information not only in a, maybe a web page but going beyond a web page to a blog that's, that's dynamic. Um, and then again the, the last group of wikis, mobile devices and OER. So I better move on here because I'm going way over. Um, let me just talk quickly about this course, Digital Storytelling, which I think incorporates many of those tools and ultimately has a, a critical thinking component built in. So that in this course, uh, students are creating their own digital narratives. The course context itself, students are, are reading, they're reading online uh, articles, they're, we have a digital storytelling rubric so that they're using this rubric to evaluate virtual field trips to evaluate other student work and, and to also think about the development of their own work. They're discussing this in the, the, the discussion board which is central to providing feedback to peers and they're writing about their own technology explorations. So if you look at this, this, uh, this cycle that's happening here, they're exploring the technology, they're creating projects, they're writing, they're reflecting, uh, they're uh, working with the instructor to assess their own learning. Um, and then they're looking at the next Web 2.0 tool. So it's, the tool is not the central thing. That the, the central thing is really the learner at the center. Uh, the course creates this context for this exploration of tools, tools that always continue to change. So that's what I'm doing in my course. And just a few quick examples, and I'll, I'll move this over to Trudy for a few final slides. This is just a screenshot of VoiceThread, which allows uh, anyone really to, to create a, a VoiceThread using uh, images that are uploaded, you can then add your voice to this. But what's interesting, it has a built-in collaborative component because then other people can, can add to this creation that you've, that you've developed. Um, so to me, that is really applying all these key principles of a, of a meta-literacy framework, of building critical thinking skills for the digital age for not only searching content, but for producing content. Uh, and not only producing content, but then being able to share that content in multiple modal modalities. Um, and just one, I forgot that I put this slide here too. I think that a way of pulling it all together is electronic portfolios. This is something that we're currently exploring at Empire State College. Uh, we're using digitation, but there's also potential for using uh, Mahara down the road. Um, I recently created one and it was we're, we're thinking about it for ourselves, for our own professional development, and thinking about the projects that we create and the work that we do. But we're also thinking about it for students as, a, as an active space for students to be thinking about a place to uh, not only produce their information, but then to create their own dynamic repositories that they can then share. Um, so that to me is a key development in this, and this perhaps is something we'll discuss in the Meta Literacy book. Um, and then I'll just hand this over to Trudy because I've been talking so much here and, uh, and she'll close out with a few slides and then if there is time we'll take some additional questions. Thank you, Tom. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I do teach an information literacy course. I've been teaching it since the year 2000 and I find it really interesting that there really wasn't a great deal of change over the first nine years that I taught the course. I think part of that was um, the fact that I just wasn't thinking along that literacy type lines um, because certainly the information environment during that time was changing. Um, however, in the last couple of years, the rate of change has been phenomenal. And um, this slide just captures a few of the things that have happened. Um, a far less focus on traditional information formats. As a librarian, that was very hard for me to come to grips with but I think it's critical. Um, I added a new segment this fall uh, on data visualization and visual literacy. The director of the campus uh, art museum came and spoke to the students and, and students really started to think about data visualization and think about ways they could create um, uh, information in this format. 
of a lot more exploration and creation of web-based tools. Students are, the students that I've had are happy to explore the tools. Some of them feel particularly uh, inadept or not adept at creating them. And there's some real resistance there, which I think is interesting. Um, but then a sense of incredible empowerment once they are able to do it. And the evaluation of information, that is always just a key component. A colleague and I, and I think Greg may actually be participating uh, or uh, on here today, uh, Greg Bobish at the University at Albany, we created an advanced course because we felt that the basic course just there wasn't enough time to go into some of these components that Tom and I have been talking about today and taught that in the spring. Um, lots more participant generated information in both of these courses. Teams are very important and that helps students to be able to, um, uh, I guess, to, to put the pieces together so that collaboration that we've been talking about today is just critical um, for students to feel successful in these new information environments. And this just gives you a, a brief overview. I mentioned things have changed dramatically in just the last couple of years. And here's uh, an outline of some of that um, and how my thinking has been changing that I need to sort of push the students as I am pushing myself because a lot of this is new to me. Students are now not doing anything on paper. Uh, really, they're doing a wiki-based uh, guide, fewer traditional sources. They have to create more content in tools that in most cases were totally no, um, unknown to them before this as creators, although they may have viewed this. Um, so let me uh, turn it over to Tom and um, again, he can see the questions and uh, we may have a moment or two to take last questions. Thanks, Rudy. So, do we have any additional questions that have emerged before we close this? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, just talking about ePortfolios as learning spaces. Mm. I, I agree that ePortfolios should definitely be seen as um, dynamic learning spaces. We're thinking about using it for educational planning. Our students actually design their own degree plans at Empire State College. So, for us, it's something that we we want students to be invested in from the very start and something that they could use in all of their courses. Uh, so if you think about the course that I had mentioned, Digital Storytelling, that's, that's an easy one to think about because they're, they're creating media projects. But I could imagine other, other courses, formats where they're uh, engaging with media or they're creating uh, projects or uh, papers as uh, using them, the, the digital portfolio itself as a space that evolves over time as they, they scaffold their own learning. Uh, so Trudy says, pushing students and pushing myself as well, modeling, learning, excellent. <laughs> good, good ending? <laughs> On that note, uh, again, I want to thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Betty and Carol for uh, developing this MOOC. We're very excited to be participating in this. Uh, it's great to be here at the University of Albany with Trudy Jacobson. Uh, we, we do most of our work virtually, so it's great to be in the same room. Um, and um, I thank you very much. It's been a great experience, and um, have a good day. Mm -hmm.